Well, good morning. Hey, hey guys. Uh, for you, those of you joining us here in the room, hello. Uh, for those of you joining us online, welcome. Uh, we're very excited uh, to be having church with you this morning. This is National Back to Church Sunday. Uh, so whether you're joining us in person or online, uh, welcome back. As you can see, what's also back is our altar, though. Is it an altar or a communion table? It's an altar? Okay, okay. We had a great movie night uh, last week, thanks all to your generosity. Uh, snow cones were eaten, uh, houses were bounced, uh, corn was popped, and face was painted, uh, thanks to you and your generosity. With that kind of generosity, we can continue to be a church that reaches outside of our walls and welcome all ages. Uh, I do have a quick announcement here, though, uh, from Dave Jett. So I'd like to welcome Dave Jett to the, to the stage for an announcement. I'm deeply saddened to report that Matt Stopman has decided his time of ministry at Crossroads is coming to an end. In part, Matt writes, I wish Crossroads the best of luck and God's providence in your future mission to bring souls to Jesus Christ, and will always be grateful for the journey, friendships, and Christian relationships I've made during the time that I was empowered and trusted as a leader in this church community. Next Sunday will be Matt's final service, and we ask for you to join us after second service in the fellowship area to celebrate Matt's time with us. In addition, we'll be collecting a love offering for Matt, and if you are able, we ask that you make your check payable to the church, and on the four line or memo line, write Matt. One final note, we will hold an informal meeting next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock in the chapel for anyone who has questions or concerns about this transition period. We're traveling a path we never expected. Thank you. In addition to that meeting, we also have uh, the Bells Group is meeting on October 1st after second service in the kitchen. Helen Upton will be presenting discoveries down under uh, from her recent travels. Uh, so bring a sandwich, bring drinks, uh, drinks and dessert will be provided. Uh, also, you can see different ways in which you can uh, serve our local missions, whether it's St. Ma'am or Forgotten Louisville. There's some excellent opportunities for us as a church to gather around those missions and serve them during this time. Uh, but for now, I invite you now to stand uh, and join me for this call to worship. Send out your light and your truth that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father and the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hallelujah.
of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth song of praise that comes from the book of Revelation, a song of praise that echoes in heaven now and will echo in heaven for eternity. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they are created and have their being. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Hosea, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgment goes forth like the sun. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Our New Testament lesson comes this morning from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. 
My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes come, also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here is a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law's lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and st yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit, um, commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. As we read these challenging passages in the Bible, uh, passages like Hosea, where the, the people of Israel, their love was, was fleeting. It would be on one day of the week and then off the rest. To the point where God became upset and he finally said, I, I want mercy, not sacrifices. I would rather you acknowledge God than give me burnt offerings. My question to you today is, are you coming in here with sacrifices and burnt offerings? Or are we coming in here today with mercy and the acknowledgement of God? Then James challenges us not to show favoritism to trust in God, that he is our provider, not whoever we think can be the biggest donor. And so as we look at these passages and we acknowledge the challenge that they provide, let us go to God in confession and repentance. First, in silent prayer. God, Father of all mercies, we, your servants, give you thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your incomparable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray Give us an awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may make known your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory throughout the ages. Amen. Now let us follow up that prayer with the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you stand for the singing of this next hymn? starting a new series that you'll see on the front of your bulletin that we're just titling Welcome to Crossroads. Again, today is National Back to Church Sunday. So again, if you're online and this is the first time you're ever joining us, you've picked a great Sunday to do that. Or for those of you who maybe uh, have been here a few times, checked us out a few times, and you're just kind of on the fence of whether or not you want to be in here, this, ser this uh, sermon series is for you. Or for those of you who are here, and you're thinking, what's, what's going on around here? What's next? What is, what, is this church, what is this church all about now? This sermon series is for you. I'm really excited for what this sermon series has to offer because this, the goal and heart of this sermon series is to fully explain what we're about here at Crossroads Christian Church, namely our mission. Our mission is summed up in three simple phrases. Love God, love others, and live it out. That's what it means to be a part of Crossroads Christian Church. You're part of a church that loves God, loves others, and lives it out. And my hope for this series is that we can break down that mission fully so that you can get a full idea of what it looks like to be a part of this church. And then I'm going to ask you a question. The question I'm going to ask you this, uh, this sermon, and it's going to be asked every sermon afterwards, is, are you in? Are you in? Uh, we're a church that loves God, loves others, and lives it out. Are you in? So let me just kind of give you a little forecast of what these next uh, four weeks are going to look like. Uh, let me break down what each sermon in this uh, sermon series is going is to sound like. Uh, this morning, I'm going to talk to you about where we got that, 
mess, that uh, mission statement. Did we make that up? No, we didn't. We got it from somewhere. And I'm going to explain to you where we got that mission statement and why we believe it is so essential and core to who we are here at Crossroads Christian Church. And I'm going to ask you a question. Are you in? Next week, uh, we're going to break down that love God part, right? We're going to talk about what does it mean to love God here at Crossroads Christian Church? What are the avenues and opportunities here at Crossroads that we give and provide for you to love God better? And we're going to have C.J. Stevens come in, if you remember him from a few weeks ago when he's preached about community. He's going to be coming in, and he's going to be breaking down our worship service. He's not going to be preaching in a traditional sense, but rather he's going to be teaching on each element of our worship service here in traditional service and in the contemporary service and explaining what is the goal behind each element. How does each element of our worship service help you love God better each and every week? And again, if this is your first time visiting, that would be a great opportunity to come and, and hopefully have some questions answered about why we do things the way we do them up here on stage. Or if, this is, if you've been here forever and maybe you haven't ever been told why we do things the way we do them up here on stage, this will be a great opportunity. Another thing uh, that I'll, t I'll tell you is that that means... Uh, traditional service, you're going to get a slightly different experience than uh, a slightly different message than contemporary service. So if there's ever a Sunday to do a double feature, to go to both, which by the way is just a great idea. Can I just say that? Go to one service, serve in the other. It's a great idea. I would encourage you to try it out if you've got nothing else to do on Sunday morning. Uh, but if you're going to do a double feature, next Sunday will be a Sunday to do it because it's going to be really exciting. But of course, we're going to provide for you. This is what it looks like here at this church. This is the avenues, the opportunities on Sunday morning that we give you to love God. The question is, are you in? Then after that, CJ is going to come back again. He's going to be preaching back to back, and he's going to talk to us about what it looks like to love others at a church, love others. Uh, sometimes we use that term really in a safe way. Those others are just nameless, harmless people. But when we start putting names and faces to the others that we're called to love, that's when it starts to get difficult. Well, one of the main things that CJ is going to talk about is that a lot of churches desire to love others. And when a church goes about loving others, it does it in two different ways. It, a church can either shepherd the flock or reach the lost. When we talk about a church loving others, we usually talk about it as either shepherding the flock, caring for the sheep, the people on the inside, loving one another, visiting one another, uh, bearing one another's burdens, or we talk about loving others as reaching the lost, doing outreach events that reach people who are not in the walls of this building, who are not here yet, and trying to help them feel safe and welcome here as a part of our family. That's what we usually think about when we think about loving others. And let me tell you, as a church, we can do both. We can do both. Those things are not mutually exclusive. A church can shepherd the flock without missing out on reaching the lost. And yet, churches often do these out of balance. In every church I've ever been to, those two ideas, those two efforts are usually out of balance. A church usually puts more effort on shepherding the flock as opposed to the reaching the lost, or they put more effort on reaching the, reaching the lost than they do on shepherding their flock. And so as a church, how can we bring those two concepts into balance with one another? Because I guarantee you here at this church, we are also out of balance from time to time. And that means we need to change some priorities and make some changes in order to bring those ideas back into balance. We won't overcorrect. We're trying hard not to overcorrect. But we are making changes in order to bring both efforts to love others into balance because they are not mutually exclusive. We can do both. So CJ's going to be explaining that in a little bit more detail uh, in two weeks. And of course, the question that we're going to ask is, all right, we're a church that loves others. That means we are going to both shepherd the flock and reach the lost, are you in? Are you in? And then on the fourth week, I'm going to come back, you're going to see me again, uh, and I'm, we're going to talk about what it means to live it out. Live it out. Uh, James 2, we didn't actually get to the part in James 2 where James really gets into it, so we'll get to that on that Sunday, but where James really talks about how 
difficult it is to both walk the walk and talk the talk. James goes on about how you can have uh, faith and works. You can't have faith without works, and you can't have works without faith, and they need to go hand in hand. So we don't just talk about loving God and loving others. We actually do it. And what does that look like in our lives? Whether it's through service, whether it's through generosity, whether it's through just showing up, what does it look like to actually live it out? And we've got a few opportunities coming up here in the next few weeks for you to live it out. Namely, we're entering a season, and you can look forward to a letter in your mailbox sometime this week. We're entering a season of stewardship and commitment. You're familiar with this season. We've gone through this season before in the past. And the question we're going to be asking through this series is, are you in? And when you talk about what does next year look like, well... I can't give you any concrete ideas or examples of what it's going to look like. I imagine it'll look like doing a lot of things we've never done before and not doing things we've always done before. But when you go about committing to this church and what we're explaining here and you start planning what does my commitment at this church both physically and monetarily look like, my question to you as we explain, here's what we're about at this church, loving God, loving others, my question is, are you in? And that commitment will be a great way to answer that question. The second opportunity is that we're going to have, uh, we're going to be launching our Socktober drive uh, here in a couple weeks. And so if you want to be a church, part of a church that loves God and loves others, that's probably the easiest, best way to jump in. Uh, if you're not familiar with Socktober, that's where we collect new socks for the homeless. Uh, throughout the month of October, so we call it Socktober, uh, and we try to collect as many pairs as possible. And this year, we are going to book in that drive with a big fall festival bash, uh, where we're going to be inviting all of our neighbors to come to join us in that generosity. They're going to we're going to ask them to bring socks too, so that we're not the only ones bringing in socks. But we're going to try to raise as many socks because that is the number one need for the homeless in our community, especially going into the colder season of winter winter. And so we want to make sure as a church that we love others and we meet those needs. So if I'm asking you the question, are you in? That would be a great way to answer. So let's get started. So that's going to be, that's going to be what this is about. Are you in? Um, we're going to be talking about what does it mean to love God, love others, and live it out. And so this morning, I kind of want to, kind of want to talk through where did we get that statement? I feel like that's not a statement that's unique to us as a church. In fact, I know I've been to churches who they have a mission or vision statement, whatever you want to call it, uh, on their walls that is literally that word for word. Uh, I, I've seen this before. Why is this such a common mission statement of not just our church, but other churches as well? Uh, well, it's because we didn't make it up. See, churches can do this sometimes. We, we make stuff up, stuff that sounds good, that sounds nice, but ultimately all it is is made up. I want to assure you right now, because we are a church that believes in the authority of Scripture, if we're going to come up with something as significant as our mission statement, we're not going to make it up ourselves. We're going to get it from Scripture because we're a church that believes in the authority of Scripture. And so we're our, what we're about here comes directly from the Bible. Now, don't get me wrong. We've paraphrased when we say love God, love others, and live it out. That is a paraphrase on our part. However, it comes from Scripture. Specifically, it comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. So if you have your Bibles, or you want to grab the one in the pew in front of you, you can follow along there, and you can just read those four verses. Matthew chapter 22, uh, verses 36 and 40. And what you need to understand is this is actually pretty late in Jesus' ministry. Um, and so at this point, Jesus has made enemies. He's made enemies, people who want to make him stumble. They want to trip him up. They want him to uh, say the wrong thing so that they can bring the hammer down. And so what they do is they come up to him and they pose to him a classic conundrum of the teachers of the law of that day. They pose to him what they believe to be an unanswerable question. What is the greatest commandment? There's over 200 to choose from in the first five books of Moses. Which is the greatest 
commandment? That's a pretty difficult question to answer. There's, uh, there's a lot of discussion. Again, this was a common conundrum that they would pose in academic circles just to start a fight. If you wanted to start a fight among the Pharisees, among the teachers of the law, this was the question that you would answer. Because the first problem that you have to be able to speak to is, is one commandment greater than the other? Or, uh, as, as, uh, again, there's 200 commandments to choose from. And, and is one more significant than the other? And there were some who would argue, some teachers of the law who would argue, you can't even say that there's a greater commandment because they're all equally important. All of them are equally important. In fact, even James kind of alludes to that. If you want to abide by those Old Testament laws, which, by the way, as Christians, we're free from in a lot of ways. Uh, but if you do want to try to abide by those Old Testament laws, James makes it very clear, you break one, you break them all. If you break one commandment, you're, you are a lawbreaker. It doesn't matter that you're a murderer or an adulterer, or whichever one you think is better or worse. No, you're a lawbreaker. Just cross the board, that's what you are. When you break one, you break them all. If you want to live according to that. Now, of course, Jesus is going to give us a commandment of grace, and we're going to learn a little bit about what that looks like, because Jesus is going to try to sum up all 200 commandments. He's not, he's not going to prioritize necessarily one over the other, but what he's going to try to do is pick some out that sum up all of the commandments, all 200 commandments that we find in the first five books of Scripture. So already, that's kind of the first thing that people are listening for. Is, is Jesus going to say that one commandment is better than the other? Because, honestly, that was another argument that was going on was, yeah, some of these commandments, all, not all commandments are created equal. For instance, don't boil a goat in its mother's milk doesn't really seem as important and as significant as you shall have no other gods before me. <laughs> right, surely, there seems to be a difference in punishment for some of these commands. If you break one commandment, you're expected to sacrifice a small pigeon, but if you break this commandment, you're doomed for eternity. Right? There seems to be a difference in punishment, so maybe some of these commandments are weighted differently from one another. And again, this is a trick question. It's a, it's, there's no right answer in the teachers of the law's mind. They would pose this question to one another because they wanted to start a conversation that could never end. But when we read Jesus' answer, we see the end of the conversation. See, Jesus responds with this, the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And I'm sure when the teachers of the law and the Pharisees heard Jesus explain that commandment, they thought to themselves, oh, of course. Yes, right. That's familiar. That's very familiar. See, what Jesus is quoting is the great Shema. And again, I've, I know I've taught this before from this stage, but, you know, before American students start class on Sunday morning, what do we say? The Pledge of Allegiance. And so you have all of us now to this day have the Pledge of Allegiance burned in our heart like letters of fire. I don't think you could possibly forget the words to the Pledge of Allegiance because it's something you said every day before school. Well, Jewish boys and girls before rabbinical school, would not say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. That would be absurd. What they said instead was the words of the great Shema. That was as familiar to them as the Pledge of Allegiance is to us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord. The Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, I want you to hear something. Did you hear that Jesus added something? See, when Jesus says the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he's ha he added something. That's not how the great Shema goes. The great Shema goes all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. Why is Jesus adding mind to the list? And a lot of biblical scholars like to tie themselves up in knots and make a big hubbub over the fact that Jesus adds the mind to how we can love the Lord our God. 
They, they, maybe there's something special about our brain, our cognitive ability, our reasoning that we need to love our Lord your God. And, and yes, yes, obviously we need to love the Lord our God with our mind. But I think what Jesus is doing by intentionally misquoting or even adding to a commandment as sacred as the great Shema is he's making it very clear that what we love the Lord our God with is not an exhaustive list. It's not a prescriptive list. We are not expected to love our Lord, the Lord our God with only our heart, with only our soul, and with only our, our strength, as if there's nothing else to us. Jesus is trying to make it clear, you love the Lord your God with everything, with everything. So we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our, all our strength, all our checkbook, all our calendar, whatever it is. You love the Lord your God with everything. That's what Jesus is trying to make clear when he adds to that list of what do I love the Lord my God with? Literally anything that you can think of. And so Jesus is just trying to list as much stuff as possible. We are to love the Lord your God with everything. And as a church, we want to be a church that loves the Lord our God with everything we have. So let me ask you a question. How many of us in this room treat God like a side hustle? Are you familiar with that term, a side hustle? It's something the kids are using, uh, especially of my generation a lot nowadays. Uh, it's, it's like a second job that you, you, you do on the side in addition to your main occupation. You do this second job, but it's not necessarily a second job in the sense that it's, you know, it's expected hours, maybe it is, but really it's something you do on the side on your own terms. You do it because it's what you really enjoy doing. Your main occupation, yes, that pays the bills, but I don't enjoy it as much, so I do this side hustle because that's what I really enjoy doing. Maybe it's, it's something that you do to get that extra joy. Maybe it's something you do because you just need a little extra spending money. This is the money that I earn from this goes to what I want to spend for fun. Everything from my main occupation goes to bills, goes to uh, groceries, goes to my needs. But then I have this side hustle so that I can get that extra little something something. Uh, maybe, it, maybe you have a side hustle because really it's, it's the most important element of a side hustle is that you do it on your terms. It's there for you when you need it, but of course if life gets busy, if life gets crazy, I can stop for a while and I won't necessarily be in a financial crisis. I don't necessarily need to be doing it. I do it because I want some joy. I want a little extra life and if, uh, a little extra money on the side. And, and if life gets too crazy, I can always come back to it later. It'll be waiting for me. How many of us treat God like that? Like when I'll go to him in my free time. I go to him on my weekends. I go to him when I need that little extra joy in my life, when I need that little extra something, something in my life. And of course, if life gets crazy, I can I can step away from God for a little bit. I'll come back to him. He'll be waiting for me. I know he will. But I'll, I'll come back to him. We put God off to the side. Let me tell you, you miss out on so much when you push God off to the side like that. So let me ask you a question. If God is our side hustle, if, it's some, if he's something we only really kind of deal with on the weekends, What's in the center? If God's off to the side, what's in the center of your life? Odds are it's probably something really admirable. It's probably something really good that you have sitting in the center. Very few people have in the center of their life something evil, uh, something truly malicious, uh, something incredibly materialistic. But maybe you do. Maybe you have a, an addiction sitting there at the center, and that's the only thing. That's what... Uh, occupies your mind 90% of the time. Maybe you have just a drive to make as much money as you can, to be as successful as you can, sitting in the center of your life, and God just plays second fiddle to that. But odds are you probably have something a little bit more admirable sounding sitting in the center of your life. 
The thing that takes up most of your time, most of your concerns, most of your worries is something admirable like, like your family or your friends. They're the ones I want to care for. They're the ones that I work hard to provide for. I will drop everything to be there for them. I put them at the center of my life. They take all of my time, all of my energy. And I go to God when I need something a little extra. But I have, I have sitting in, in the center of my life something admirable. Uh, I, I have a legacy that I want to leave behind. A legacy of, of service, of, of reaching, of, of meeting people and and loving people. That's what I have at the center. That's what I'm obsessed about. That's what I lay awake at night thinking about is my legacy. Maybe it's my kids or my grandkids. Those are the ones that take up all of my time, all of my energy. And God is sitting off to the side. What's sitting in the center of your life? And let me ask you this question. What would it take to move God off from the side and into the center and take what's in the center and move it off to the side. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what? You're telling me I got to deprioritize my kids, my grandkids? Have you met them? They're, they're perfect. They're God's gifts. Yes, they're, they're great gifts, terrible gods. <laughs> yes, I'm telling you, you, you need to deprioritize your kids and your grandkids. I'm telling you, you may need to deprioritize your, your career, your job, and place God in the center if that's what it takes. I'm telling you this with confidence because God makes us a promise that if we seek first the kingdom of God, everything else gets added to us. That thing that you're, you're focused so much on, that you lay awake at night, that you think, this is what I need to be working towards, working for so much. I, 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 I can't afford God. God just sits on the sidelines when I need him. This is the thing that, that takes up my, my time, my, my mind, my strength. If you were to put God in the center, that would get added to you. Kids, grandkids, legacy. It gets added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else gets added to you. Can I give you the last 10% of honesty? Here's the last 10%. Uh, especially as we don't have that many new people here present. <laughs> as a pastor, I've been struggling with this. See, the thing that's been living at the center of my life is something that's really admirable, but it's not God. The thing I'm always tempted to put in the center of my life is the church. This building, this 501c3, this organization. I spent so much time serving and working and, and thinking and praying and, 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 and wanting to, and, and obsessing over this church and what's gonna happen and where are we going next, that I put God off to the sidelines. Odds are, if you're here at this church, if you're a leader at this church, maybe you're struggling with that too. We want to be a church that loves the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our strength, with all our mind, with all our soul. We want to put God at the center, even if it means deprioritizing church. Let me tell you that. I'm committed to that. I want to model that for you guys myself, and I hope I do. I know we have a leadership, a council that wants to model that for you as well. But we want to love the Lord our God with everything and let everything else get added to us. Because when we seek first the kingdom of God, your great kids get added to you, your grandkids get added to you, your church gets added to you. We want to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. Let's get back to the story. Because that's how we say we love God. <laughs> 
Uh, where did the love of others come from? See, back at the story, Jesus has just said, this is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And everyone is kind of going, yeah, we get it. We've heard that one before. Uh, that one is uh, pretty, pretty low-hanging fruit, if you will. Uh, if anything, what Jesus has just done, if you want to get really technical, is he's just summed up the first five commandments of the Ten Commandments. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the first five are about how we can love God. You shall have no other gods before me. You will not build a graven image. You will remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Those first five commandments of the Ten Commandments are all about how can we love God. And there's a lot of commandments afterwards that talk about how we can love God. God has just summed up, Jesus has just summed up a bulk of the commandments. And now he's going to sum up the rest of them. See, he says, and the second is like it. And at that moment, there's probably a little bit of a record scratch. Or second one, we just asked you what the greatest commandment was. We didn't ask for what the second greatest commandment is. Where are you going with this one, Jesus? Now, he just pulled out the great Shema, so that was, that was the big daddy, okay? I wonder what the second one is gonna, where the second one is going to come from. So Jesus says, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm sure all the, all the uh, teachers of the law, the scribes, the Pharisees, they're sitting there scratching their head going, love your neighbor as yourself, love your neighbor as yourself. Where, where did I, they didn't, they didn't have Bibles, they didn't have books, they had scrolls. Um, where did I, where is that one? Oh, oh, here it is. Oh, it's under various laws. What, where did, this is a footnote. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in that one commandment, Jesus has now summed up the last five commandments of the Ten Commandments. The last five are don't commit adultery, don't covet, don't steal, don't lie, don't murder. All of those are ways in which we love our neighbor as ourselves. And that's where we get this idea to love others. Love God and love others is because Jesus has now said, two greatest commandments. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love others. That's how we paraphrase it. This is where we get that idea from. So let's talk about this last commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. I think it's an important phrase, and we have to make sure that we understand it fully. Specifically, the as yourself part of that commandment. So often we, we actually cut off the love your neighbor, the as yourself part of this. And we just say, love your neighbor. And we cut off the as yourself. See, what you have to realize is that in order to fully obey this commandment, we have to love ourselves. And I, that gets a little tricky. And I think Christians get nervous hearing about how we need to love ourselves because we are worried about accidentally loving ourselves too much. That's pride, isn't it? When you love yourself too much. So we get a little nervous when we talk about loving ourselves, and I, I get that. But let me tell you this. If you follow this commandment fully, the way that it's intended to, you can never love yourself too much as long as you're following this commandment the way that it's written. I say to you, love yourself as much as you want, but love your neighbor as yourself. Too often, we do this commandment incorrectly. And I'm sure many of us have been on the receiving end and have been hurt by people doing this commandment incorrectly. Too often, we love ourselves at the expense of our neighbor rather than loving our neighbor as ourself, right? That's why we get so nervous about this idea of loving ourselves to the point where we can sometimes wallow in low self-esteem and in self-doubt, uh, and, and we can be incredibly insecure about who we are because we're so afraid of loving ourselves. And it's because we've been hurt by someone who loved themselves at the expense of their neighbor. We've been hurt by someone who loved themselves at our expense. Chances are, if you're human, you've experienced what that looks like. At some point in your life, someone has loved themselves at your expense. 
And so we think, well, then the solution is just not to love myself at all. I don't want to do that. I don't want to love myself at other people's expense. So I just don't love myself at all. And what ends up happening now is I love others. I love my neighbor at my expense. I love my neighbor at my expense. Maybe that's where you're at. And you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do everything I can for them because they deserve it, but I don't. I'm going to bend over backwards for every person in my life that I know, but I will not expect or deserve them to do the same for me. Let me just tell you, if that's the way you love people, you love others at your own expense, that's really admirable and noble, but it sells your love short of what it could be. Because the reality is, you are loved, whether you think you deserve it or not. You are loved, whether that love comes from you or not. You are loved because God loves you. I was explaining this to the kids a couple weeks ago. Uh, we have a chapel in our, in our uh, Baby's Day Out program here. And I was explaining to them how when God made the seas, he said, oh, that's good. And when God made light, he said, oh, that's good. And when he made the fish and the birds, he's like, oh, that's good. He made the plants, the sun, the moon, the stars. He looked at those and he said, oh, that's good. He made all of the animals. The kids love the animals. And they, he's like, oh, that's good. And he looked around and he said, I want to make something that looks like me. And he made you. Because you look a little bit like him. And he looked at you and he said, that's very good. That's very good. And yeah, we messed up. At some point in our life, we strayed from God. At some point in our life, we made this choice where we looked at what God had given us and we said, I want more. Thank you, God, for giving me a way to live, but I actually kind of want more than that. I want, to, I want to try to see what I can provide for myself. And, and we strayed from him. That's what sin is. That's what Adam and Eve did. Thank you, God, for everything I have. But I want more. I want the tree that you told us not to eat from. We make the same choice, too, at some point in our life. We stray from God. But you want to know what? That doesn't stop him. Just because you wandered off, you made a choice that maybe you wanted more than what God had provided you. That didn't stop him from chasing after you. To doing whatever was necessary to get you back. Because God loves you so very much that he died on the cross. He took your place. He took the punishment, the separation, the distance upon himself so that you could be with him forever because God loves you and now we love our neighbor as ourselves so let me end with this question are you in are you in we want to be a church that loves the Lord our God with all our heart all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. And I'm not saying that's going to be easy because it might mean deprioritizing things that feel really important. I'm telling you, love God with everything and those important things get added to you. Are you in? We want to be a church that loves our neighbor as ourselves. We don't love ourselves at the expense of our neighbor. We don't love our neighbor at the expense of ourselves. We love our neighbor as ourselves. And considering how much we've been loved, that's a crazy amount of love that we want to give away to every person who will take it. So my question is, are you in? Let's pray. Dear God, I pray that you would come and you would inspire us with ways in which we can love you more. 
God, I pray that you would convict us if we've pushed you off to the side. That you would give us a clear plan of action for how we can move you to the center. Not just reading our Bible more or praying more or doing more, but that we would know how to put you at the very center of our heart. God, I pray that you would give us neighbors that we could love. God, I pray that we would, uh, we would repent of not loving ourselves or not loving our neighbors well. Of not acknowledging the love that you have for us and not being willing to pass on that love to those around us. God, I pray that we would honor you in all, our, in all these things and that we would chase after you with everything that we are. And we would be that kind of church. It's in your name that I pray these things. Amen. eternity and whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with those who are contrite and humble in spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite. My prayer is that you go out revived this week. You're dismissed. Go in peace.
I'm deeply saddened to report that Matt Stottman has decided his time of ministry at Crossroads is coming to an end. In part, Matt writes, I wish Crossroads the best of luck and God's providence in your future mission to bring souls to Jesus Christ and will always be grateful for the journey, friendships, and Christian relationships I've made during the time that I was empowered and trusted as a leader in this church community. Next Sunday will be Matt's final service, and we ask that you join us after second service in the fellowship area to celebrate Matt's time with us. In addition, we'll be collecting a love offering for Matt, and if you're able, I ask that you make your check payable to Crossroads and on the memo line, write Matt. One final note, we will hold an informal meeting next Saturday morning at 10 a.m. in the chapel for anyone who has questions or concerns about the transition period on the path that we really never expected to be on. Thank you. Would you please stand with me as we begin worship this morning? Today is back to church Sunday. And what that means and what we're trying to exemplify with that is that, you know, whether you're worshiping at home or here, there is power in worshiping together. And so as we begin worship this morning, our songs that we're going to be singing are going to remind us about the power of fellowship together. I'm 
as we continue worship this morning, this is a Crossroads Christian Church worship band original, and it is truly how I feel about all of you. One, two, three, four. On Sunday every week, I see my family. These doors are open to the poor and north and to the lost and found. Oh, how sweet the sound. They're smiling faces and an end. Inspiration, a place where the spirit flows. You're praying with the pros, and those prayers show you'll never be alone. Cause you're in the Savior's home. This is my family, where the blind can see, where we Comfort the suffering, a place for honesty to kneel down before the King on Sunday every week. I see my family throughout the congregation. There's an affirmation that no matter where you're from, you can't escape the love of our Savior's graces. Lord, that's the basis that makes your people free. We're here to praise the King, and you'll never be alone. Because the King is on the throne. This is my faith. Where the blind can see, where we meet the needs and comfort the suffering, a place for honesty to kneel down before the King on Sunday every week. I'm with the down and hurting, the newly saved and learning, the pastor who can always make you smile and i'm with the strong believers with that holy spirit fever dancing and singing in the aisle this is my family where the blind can see where we need the need to comfort the suffering a place for honesty to kneel down before the King on Sunday every week. I see my family. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you all watch nature shows? YouTube suggested a video to me the other day called Battle at Kruger. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It was filmed in a park in Africa, and it depicts a scene of predator versus prey. In it, a herd of wildebeests are drinking at a watering hole. Then a pride of lions descend and separate a young wildebeest from the herd, intending to make it their lunch. Well, there were some crocodiles that were involved, too, which makes the whole scene that much crazier. But ultimately, what happens is that the herd realizes there is safety in numbers. So they return and they rescue the young wildebeest. Five lions were no match for a herd of 50. Now, of course, there's a spiritual lesson here. When we are alone, we're vulnerable, and we're weak, and maybe even lost. But when we are together we are able to take on so much more. That's true in life, and it's true as believers. Because you see, we were made to worship. Not only that, we were made to worship together. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 say, 
And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Because not meeting together and not worshiping together has consequences. It leaves us open to attack. Psalm 42, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? God hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't forgotten any of us. But when you're far from him, it can sure feel that way. And that is what the enemy is counting on. It's what he's waiting for. When we feel farthest from God, that's when it's easiest for the enemy to attack. We are vulnerable when we are alone, and we are stronger together. So remember, there is hope. The psalmist reminds us to hope in God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in, in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall praise him again, my salvation and my God. Father God, lead us back to life in you.
I'd like to dismiss uh, the students to, uh, no, it's not me. What are we doing? Um, channel. Check. Um, so, uh, yeah, dismiss the students. Uh, for you parents, we moved actually where our kids are meeting. They're no longer meeting in the basement with no natural lighting. We're actually meeting up here in room 106. It's the second room on your right as you go into those classrooms. So uh, just a quick heads up, too, when you go to pick up your kids, they're not going to be down in the basement. I feel like I'm coming through a little bit. Um, so uh, we're ki uh, kicking off a new series this Sunday that we're really, really excited about. Again, this is National Wa Welcome Back to Church Sunday. So this is your first time joining us. You came at the right time. This series is for you. Or maybe you've come a few times in the past and you're kind of on the fence wondering, is this the right church for me? Uh, this series is for you. Um, or maybe you've been here a long time <laughs> and you're wondering, hey, what's going on around here? Like, what, what are we about here? What's, what's, what's happening? Uh, this series is for you. We're titled the series just simply, Welcome to Crossroads. <laughs> We're going to be talking uh, through uh, what does it look like to be a part of Crossroads Christian Church. And the best way to sum up what that means, I'm going to try to sum up four weeks. Here you go. For sum up what it means to be a part of Crossroads Christian Church is that mission statement to love God, love others, and live it out. That's what it means to be a part of Crossroads Christian Church. So we love God, we love others, and we live it out. And so my question, the question that I'm going to ask you today, the question that we're going to ask a lot over the course of this series is, are you in? We're going to do our best to kind of explain to you in, in detail, flesh out in detail, what does it mean to love God, love others, and live it out? And now the question, are you in? So let me give you a little forecast of what the next few weeks are going to look like. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce you to you, where did we get that phrase? Did we make that up? No, we didn't. We got it from somewhere. Uh, love God, love others, live it out. That's not something that we just like invented one morning. Uh, we got it from somewhere else, someone who knows a little bit better about what the church should be than we do. Uh, and so I'm going to explain to you how we got that phrase and why we think that that's our mission uh, and what that looks like to some degree. And then we're going to break it down line by line. Next week, we're going to talk about loving God. And C.J. Stevens, if you remember from a few weeks ago, taught about community here. He's going to be back, and he's going to preach to you guys. It's not really going to be a traditional sermon, but he's going to teach you guys what are the opportunities that we provide here at church, specifically on Sunday morning, to help you love God better. And he's going to break down, he's going to teach, again, it's not going to be a traditional sermon, but he's going to break down each element of our worship service. We're going to do a worship song, and then he's going to break down what is the heart behind that song, specifically the first song or the second song. We're going to be having communion next week. I know it's the wrong week for it, but we're going to be having communion. How is, it, how is the practice, the element of communion teach us to love God, help us love God better. So it's going to be a great week. Again, if you are, if this is your first time here, and you're wondering, all right, why is our service set up the way that it is? That's going to be a great Sunday for you to come as we explain moment by moment what we're doing here, and how does that help us love God. It also means that traditional service is going to get kind of a, a different message than, than contemporary, in this contemporary service. So if there's ever a Sunday for you to do a double feature, like a Barbenheimer, but for church, that would be the Sunday to do it, all right? Uh, and uh, honestly, great idea. Go to one service, serve in another. Uh, I would highly encourage you, if you haven't done a double feature, do a double feature. Next week would be a great week to do that. And then when we get done with explaining fully what we do here as a church every Sunday to help you love God better, the question will be, are you in? 
And then we're going to talk about love others. What does it mean to love others? And, and again, CJ is going to be back, and he's going to be explaining in more detail. But and when a church decides to love others, because a lot of churches try to love others, when they decide to love others, they do it in two different ways. There's two different avenues through which a church goes about loving others. The first avenue is we shepherd the flock. We shepherd the flock. We have people in our church that we need to care for. We need to bear one another's burdens. The second avenue in which the church goes about uh, loving others is we reach the lost. We reach the lost. There are people outside of our building, outside of our walls, who need to hear the message that we have, who have needs that we can meet, physical needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs that we as a church can meet. So when we love others, we shepherd the flock and we reach the lost. Let me tell you, almost every church I've ever been to has one over the other. I don't know why we think that these two things are mutually exclusive, that we have to choose either shepherding the flock or reaching the lost, but we, we do, and every church I've ever been to prioritizes one over the other, and this church is no exception. So we're going to be making some changes here. Again, we're not trying to overcorrect. We're trying to keep those two avenues in balance with one another, to do them both equally. But that's a goal, the goal behind quite a few of the changes that you're probably seeing around here, is we want to try to do both shepherding the flock and reaching the lost. And CJ's going to explain more of that even further. Then the last week in this series, I'm going to be back, and we're going to talk about living it out. <laughs> There's what's not new is this challenge of Christians to not just walk the walk, but talk the talk. James 2 talks about that quite a bit, that you can't have faith without works, and you can't have works without faith. We don't want to just be a church that says we love people and love God, love God and love others, but we want to be a church that actually does that. And what does that look like, and what is the challenge? And of course, the question that we'll ask at the end of that is, are you in? And the reason we're going to be asking that question, are you in, is because there's going to be several opportunities for you to say, I'm in, and a lot of different ways in which you can go about saying, I'm in, over the next couple weeks. See, we're entering a season of stewardship and commitment. If you've been here for a while, you know what this season is like. You might be getting a letter in your mail about stewardship and commitment. And that's going to be, as we look into the next year, what that looks like, what the, what the budget needs to look like, we're going to be asking you guys, are you in? And that might be a great opportunity for you to answer. Another opportunity to say that I'm in is up here in October, we're going to start our Socktober drive. If you're not familiar with that, we try to gather as many new adult socks as we can for the homeless in our community. And we've gotten thousands over the past couple of years. Well, we want to try to, we want to try to hit a new, a new record this year. We want you to come and bring socks so that we can be loving God and loving others through meeting these physical needs of the homeless, especially as we enter the winter months. And so we're going to be capping off October with this fall festival that's going to be fun and it's going to be for everyone in our community. And we're going to be inviting them in to that drive to love others. Yes, we're going to have, we're going to have face painting again. That was a hit at movie night. Uh, there's lines lying around the block for face painting. We're going to have face painting again, but we're not just inviting kids and families to get their faces painted. We want to we invite them to help join us in this drive to get socks out to the people who need it the most. And so we want to be a church that loves God, loves others, and lives it out. And so the question, the question is, are you in? And again, there's going to be opportunities for you to answer over the course of the next few weeks. So let's talk about where we got this phrase. Where did we get this idea? Love God, love others, uh, live it out. Uh, you know, I, one thing I told you at the very beginning of the sermon is that we did not make that up. We didn't make it up. At churches, we can sometimes make stuff up. Uh, you go to churches, and sometimes you see, their, uh, you see their mission statements or vision statements, and you can go, okay, that sounds nice, but it's made up. Um, you know, someone made it up one morning uh, after they got out of the shower or something. Uh, we did not make up the idea of loving others, loving God, loving others, and living it out. Uh, it's a paraphrase, but if we're a church that believes in the authority of Scripture, 
we are not going to just make up something as core as the mission of this church. We're going to look to Scripture to provide for us that core message. And again, we kind of paraphrase it a little bit when we say love God, love others, live it out, but we got it from the Bible. Where does that come from? It comes specifically from Jesus. If you want to grab a Bible in the pew in front of you and turn to Matthew chapter 22, I encourage you, if you didn't bring a Bible from home, uh, grab one in the pew in front of you, get on your phone. It counts. If, if The Bible still counts if it's on your phone. Um, grab, grab it. Turn to Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Now, I'm not going to read it to you, but I'm going to tell you the story, and hopefully you can kind of catch the beats and, and match up what's written down there with what I'm saying. See, in Matthew chapter 22, we're pretty late in Jesus's ministry. So at this point, Jesus has enemies. He has people who are out to get him. They're trying to get him to trip up on his words so that they can finally have an excuse to bring the hammer down. And so they come up with come to him with kind of a classic conundrum, uh, an academic question. Uh, it was kind of an icebreaker question that they would ask in academic circles very frequently if you wanted to start a conversation that would never end. And they asked Jesus this conundrum, this question, what is the greatest commandment? What is the greatest commandment? Again, if you wanted to start an endless conversation with the teachers of the law and the Pharisees back then, that'd be the question to start with. The conversation would go on forever and ever, and for a lot of reasons. I mean, the first thing is, are, is our commandments different in, in weight? Is one commandment really better than another? Is that even possible to say that one commandment is greater than another? There's over 200 commandments in the first five books of the Bible, in the books of Moses, and when they refer to commandments, they're almost certainly referring to the commandments that you find in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And again, over 200 commandments that cover a wide breadth of normal, everyday life. And there were some who would argue all commandments are created equal. In fact, even uh, James, in James chapter 2, as we mentioned before, says, hey, if you want to live under all those commandments, great. But just know, if you do, if you break one of them, you break all of them. Because there's definitely a school of thought, hey, all these commandments are equal in weight. To say that one is better than another would be to devalue what God has said. Uh, and, and I don't think what Jesus is going to say, and this is what the genius of what Jesus is going to say, is he's not necessarily going to devalue commandments as much as he's going to sum up commandments. He's going to sum up a bunch of commandments, half the commandments in one statement and the other half of commandments in the other. But the other thing is, you know, maybe some commandments are created equal. Don't boil a goat in its mother's milk may not necessarily be as urgent as do not murder, right? So maybe some commandments aren't created equal. And again, Jesus is going to speak to it in this genius moment that doesn't devalue anything, but sums it all up. And he says, here it is, the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. It's the greatest commandment. And everyone listening to that probably would have maybe even kind of gone, ah, maybe even rolled their eyes with how obvious of an answer that was. See, the answer that Jesus is giving is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's referred to as the great Shema. And again, I've taught about this before from this stage, but American school children, when we start the day before school, we are taught to say together as a chant the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'm willing to bet, because of that practice, every person in this room has written on their hearts the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't think you ever really forget that. It's like riding a bicycle, right? We all know the words, the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, Jewish school children in the first century, Jewish boys and girls wouldn't have said the Pledge of Allegiance before school. That would have been ridiculous. What they said instead were the words, the great Shema, every morning. It would have been written on their hearts. It would have been as familiar to them as the Pledge of Allegiance is to you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength. 
And so when Jesus says, that's the greatest commandment, I'm sure a lot of people go, yeah, that makes sense. I see where he's coming from. That's pretty obvious. Low-hanging fruit, even. And yet, there's something about the way Jesus presents the commandment that I think is, is interesting. Jesus misquotes it. He misquotes the great Shema. He doesn't, the great Shema says, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, a lot of scholars, biblical scholars, like twist themselves up into knots as far as why does Jesus throw in the mind? What is it about human rationality that needs to love God? I, I don't know how much there we really need to read into the mind as much as we need to read into the fact that Jesus felt free to add to the list. Jesus felt free to add to the list of what we should be loving the Lord our God with. Jesus did not see what we should love the Lord our God with, that list in Deuteronomy, as exhaustive. He did not read it as, love the Lord your God with only your heart, with only your soul, and with only your strength. For Jesus, he read that commandment as, love the Lord your God with everything you could possibly think of. Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, strength, checkbook, calendar, you name it. Love the Lord your God with it. That's why Jesus felt free to add to that list. It's because the key to this commandment is that we love the Lord our God with everything. Everything. That's what we want to be as a church. We want to love the Lord our God with everything. Now I want to point out the challenge to that. See, many of us would probably treat God a bit like a side hustle. We treat God like a side hustle. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, that idea. It's pretty common in kids my age nowadays that we, we all have a, a side hustle. We have a primary occupation that sits in the center, but on the side, sometimes kids will like to start a side hustle. Maybe it's a hobby that you've turned into a, an Etsy shop, right? It's something that you enjoyed doing that now you're monetizing, trying to make a little money on the side. Uh, it's a small part-time job or some contract work that you do for fun. And there's a lot of reasons why you would start a side hustle. Maybe you, you, you really enjoy what you're doing. It's made, your side hustle is what you really enjoy. What your main occupation is makes money, it pays the bills, but it's not necessarily what you really enjoy, so you have a side hustle because that's what you really enjoy. Or maybe you, you have a side hustle because you need a little extra money. You know, what, what's, what the main occupation provides pays the bills, meets the needs, gets the groceries. But when it comes for that fun, you know, I, I need a little extra money, so I have a little side hustle whenever I need a little extra something, something. But of course, the greatest advantage to a side hustle is that it's there for you when you need it. And if you don't need it, or if life gets busy, like life gets a little crazy, you can stop for a while. It'll, It'll be waiting for you when you get back, that kind of job, that kind of occupation. How many of us treat God like a side hustle? He's there for me when I need him. When I need a little extra joy in my life, I'll, I'll go to him. I'll, I'll go to him on the weekends. When I, when I have the free time, I'll, I'll, I'll go to God. But, you know, if life gets crazy, if life gets busy, I, I, can, I can drop it for a while. He'll be, he'll be waiting for me when I get back. How many of us treat God like our side hustle? If that's maybe where you're feeling, let me ask you this. What's in the center? What's in the center of your life? What's that thing that takes up all of your, all of your thoughts, all of your energy? What keeps you up at night? Odds are, I'm willing to bet, odds are it, it's probably something pretty admirable. It, it might not. Maybe the thing in the center of your life is, is, is an addiction, is a hurt, a habit, a hang-up. That's what holds all of, your, all of your energy, all of your time. It sucks you dry. Maybe it's something materialistic, like a, like a career focus or the biggest paycheck. That's what you drive for. That's what you push for. That's what gets your heart, soul, mind, strength each and every day. But I'm pretty willing to bet that what's in the center of your life, what you tell yourself is at the center of your life, is probably something admirable. Uh, my kids. That's what's at the center of my life. That's what runs my calendar. That's what gets me up in the morning and 
puts me to bed at night. Our grandkids. That's what, I, that's what I think about while I'm driving around places. Maybe you're thinking about your, your legacy or, or a nonprofit that you serve at. That's what, I, that's what I put all of my time, my energy, my effort into. But God, God can sit on the side. What would it take to put God in the center? We want to be a church that loves the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. What would it take for you to put God in the center? And I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, are you, are you hearing yourself? You're telling me to deprioritize my kids. <laughs> are you hearing that? You're telling me to deprioritize my grandkids. You're, trying, you're telling me to deprioritize uh, de my volunteer opportunities, to deprioritize my school. Are you hearing yourself? That's crazy. Yeah. Here's the promise. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and everything else gets added to you. The problem with keeping God off on a side hustle is not that it doesn't work. It works. When you have God off on the side, when he's only there for you on the weekends and you only go to him on the weekends, it works. You get by but you miss out on so much. You miss out on everything else getting added to you. So when I tell you, yeah, it might take you deprioritizing your kids to put God in the center, guess what? Seek first the kingdom of God and kids, grandkids, volunteer opportunities, all of that gets added to you. All of that gets added to you. Last 10% of honesty here as a pastor, as a leader at this church, and I'm sure uh, fellow leaders at this church, you might resonate a little bit with me on this. I struggle with this. See, the thing that's at the center is the church. It's the building, it's the organization, it's the 501c3. That's the thing that keeps me up at night. That's what I'm worrying about. That's what I'm putting all of my time and energy and effort, and I've got God off on the side. And I don't even know I'm doing that because, you know, it's the church, right? Surely, surely that's a good thing to have at the center of my life, but I've put God off to the side. I'm telling you, we want to be a church where you love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And if that means you need to deprioritize church, I'm okay with that. Because I believe that when you seek first the kingdom of God, everything else gets added to you. Church gets added to you. Your kids get added to you. Your grandkids get added to you. Your job gets added to you. Everything else gets added to you. When we seek first God. So we want to be a church that first loves the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. And the question is, are you in? So let's move on with the story. Jesus says that. Everyone kind of goes, okay, great, good answer. That sums up the first five of the Big Ten, right, of the Big Ten Commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That pretty much sums up the first five. Uh, that's why we don't have graven images. It's why we remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. All of that is in, in this goal, in pursuit of this goal, to love the Lord your God with everything. That sums it pretty much pretty well. And then Jesus says, hang on, the second's like it. And at that point, there's probably like a record scratch and a freeze. Er, er, what? Second? Whoa. That's not what we asked. We asked you, what is the greatest commandment? Now you're giving us two. Jesus says, the second's like it. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. And everyone's thinking, what? Where does that come from? Where did you get, where did, I don't even remember. Love your neighbor as yourself. Where, where's that found? I, I don't, they didn't have books. I don't know why they'd be flipping pages. Uh, but, uh, oh, here it is. It's under various laws. This is a footnote. That's the second greatest commandment, Jesus? Really? Really? That's what, yeah, it's the second greatest commandment. Because if love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength sums up the first five of the Big Ten, love your neighbor as yourself sums up the last five of the Big Ten. Love your neighbor as yourself is why we don't murder, why we don't steal, why we don't lie, why we don't 
commit adultery, right? All of that, all of those things are in pursuit of this goal to love our neighbor as ourself. And so Jesus is able to confidently say, all the law, all the prophets hang on those two. Love God, love others, live it out. That's where we get it. So let me just kind of break down that last love your neighbor as yourself. Because we're going to get, again, every Sunday going forward, we'll have an opportunity to kind of break it down even further. So let me just kind of briefly land on this. Uh, when we hear that statement, the as yourself part, really important. We sometimes cut that out because it makes us a little uncomfortable. Sometimes we just sum it up as love your neighbor. We don't bother with the as yourself part in the end. And let me tell you, if you want to love your neighbor, it means you yourself have to be loved. It means you yourself have to realize, I am loved. If you really want to love your neighbor, you have to ultimately love yourself and realize just how much you've been loved. And we get a little bit squirmy when we think about loving ourselves, and there's good reason for that. We get nervous about when we hear about, oh, I need to love myself or realize I've been loved because we get worried that, is it possible for me to love myself too much? Is it possible to think that I'm so loved that I get a big head about it, that I become prideful, right? We get a little squirmy, a little nervous about that. Let me tell you this. You cannot love yourself too much as long as you appropriately obey this commandment. Right? You can't love yourself too much as long as you're appropriately obeying this commandment. I say to you, be as loved as you can be. Love yourself as much as you want as long as you love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go crazy feeling loved. Go crazy with it, as long as you love your neighbor as yourself. But too often in our world, we've probably been hurt or hurt others by loving ourselves at the expense of our neighbor. If you're a human who's lived on this earth for more than five years, You've probably been on the receiving end of when someone has loved themselves at your expense. And that can be incredibly painful. And so, if that's what you're reacting to, if that's what makes you think, for some reason, I'm just not loved, or I'm not lovable, what we end up doing is we swing to the other side of the pendulum, and we try to love our neighbor at our own expense. We try, to, we try to avoid loving, other, loving myself at others' expense, so I'll swing to the other side of things, and I'll love my neighbor at my expense because I am not loved. I'm not lovable. I'll love them. They are lovable, but I am not. I, I'll go to the ends of the earth for them, but I can't expect them to do the same for me. I see the value in them, but I just don't think I have that same value back. Loving others at your own expense sounds really noble and admirable. But at the end of the day, it's bad love. It's so much less than the love that you could be giving out. Because it's so much lo less than the love that you've been given. See, you are loved desperately. I was explaining this to the kids. We have a chapel on Tuesday mornings that how when God made the earth, he, he made the light. And he looked at the light and said, that's good. And then he made the, the sky and the seas, and he looked at those, and he went, that's good. And he filled those sky and seas with birds and fish, and he looked at all those birds and fish, and he looked at them, and he said, that's good. He made the, the ground with plants on them, and he looked at the plants and the ground, and he said, that's, that's good. He looked at the sun, the moon, made the sun, moon, stars. He looked at all those and their beauty and their infiniteness, and he said, that's good. And then he made all the animals. The kids love the animals. And, and he made them all, and, and he looked at them all, and he said, that's good. And then he said, I want to make something that looks like me. I've made all of this. I want to make something that looks like me. 
so he made you. He made you to look a little bit like him. And when he had finished making a person, he said, that's very good. That's very good. You are so desperately loved. At some point in our life, we, we wander off. At some point in our life, like Adam and Eve, we look at what God has given us and we said, this is good, but I want more. This is good, but I would like to know what evil is like. Everything you've made is good, but I want the thing I can't have. Thank you. I want more. Adam and Eve made that choice. We make it too. At some point in our life, it's, it's just inevitable. I don't know if we're born into it or what, if it's a decision that we're all doomed to make at some point, but at some point, we all make that choice. God, thank you for everything you've given me, but I want more. And we wander off. And God doesn't let us go. Even though we all wander off, God doesn't let us go. In fact, he goes to whatever lengths were necessary so that we can be with him again. The distance that we create when we wander from God, God sent his son to the earth so that that distance might be closed. The walls that we put up between us and God through our sin and our guilt, Jesus died on the cross to tear those walls down so that we could be with him. The nature of death and our temporariness, God took away so that we could live eternally with him. God loves you so much that there is literally nothing that is between you and him anymore. That's the kind of love that we give out to anyone, to everyone, to our neighbor. That's what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. So my question, are you in? I don't know what that looks like for you today. Maybe it looks like a, a decision to follow Christ. Maybe it looks like a, a decision to, to come back next Sunday, hear a little bit more. Maybe it looks like a decision to keep coming back, no matter what happens. My question is, are you in? Let's pray. Dear Father, I pray that we come to you, that we would be convicted by the ways in which we have put you to the side. God, I pray that we would examine those dearly loved goals, people in our heart that we've placed in the center instead of you. That we would have the courage to replace them with you and trust that they will be added to us as a result. God, I pray that we would feel the love that you have for us, that it would feel new to us in ways that we've never felt before. And God, I pray that you would give us unique, practical ways that we can share and express those loves with others this week. God, it's in your name that I pray these things. Amen. Stand with me, please.
service, I want to thank all of you both here and worshiping with us at home for choosing to spend this morning in worshiping our Heavenly Father. One of the most important things that you can do in life after accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior is to pray and to worship together with others. When our prayers are done with unity and agreement and harmony, God hears and God answers. The whole church is surely greater than its parts. And when I think of places lacking in unity, the church is not the first thing that I imagine. So I pray, Lord, this morning that you would help the church as a whole find unity on the issues that we face. Help us remember that we are a family of believers and families will disagree. But what is paramount is that all our decisions, our hearts, and our minds are Christ facing and that where the church must be responsible i pray that you would guide us in making decisions based on your word not our personal preference if we can find unity in you lord surely we can find less division among ourselves you are the truth our mighty god you are our jehovah nisi the lord our banner so let us go out from god's house this morning with this final prayer now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Christ Jesus, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a blessed week, and we'll see you next Sunday for worship.